So it's the importance of uh, Venezuela in a global uh, yeah, setting there. So, Eric. Thank you. Um, I know it's getting late. We have a storm upon us. I'll keep it short. Um, yes, so that um, I think it's really going to be important for us to have some time to have a, a bit of a Q&A, a bit of a discussion here, because really, in a sense, we're sort of already kind of here all on the same page, and I don't think that I need to convince anybody here about the importance of Venezuela. You came out on a Friday night right before a snowstorm, so obviously you care as much as we all do. So um, I just want to give a little bit of an overview, some of the important issues, some of the larger geopolitical issues, I think, that are in play when we're talking about Venezuela, what's happening in Latin America, and why this is all important. So um, let me just begin very quickly by pointing something out that I think often or too often is left out of the discussion of Venezuela, and that is this little thing called colonialism. And U.S. colonialism and U.S. imperialism in Latin America has a very, very, very long and very sordid history. And Venezuela is, in many ways, the center of that, especially in the 20th century. I don't know if you've ever uh, seen any of the old 1950s uh, newsreels or documentaries about development in Venezuela, but it's fascinating. It's, you know, usually, you know, some narrator comes on and he says, Come to this, this small, isolated country in Latin America is really exploding in growth. You see the oil production. You see more oil production, and oil production is really what we're talking about here. You know, and Venezuela was made into, essentially, an oil colony of the United States, and to a large extent, that's how it operated for decades. Now, the reason I bring that up is because we have to understand what the Bolivarian Revolution and what Hugo Chavez means in relation to U.S. imperialism. It means the first time that a Latin American country since, you know, let's say since the CIA assassinations and coups of the 1950s, the first time that a country in Latin America was able to break free of the imperial system and to set a course for itself, a course of development, a course of independent political, economic, social, and cultural development that was not beholden to US imperialism, that was not even beholden to global capitalism, with the exception, of course, of oil and global oil markets, which, of course, plays a central role in how Venezuela is able to function. Unfortunately, the legacy of US colonialism left Venezuela with an oil-dependent economy. And the Venezuelan people and Hugo Chavez and the Bolivarian Revolution was forced into a position of having to harness that in order to develop the country. So when people say, oh, you see, Venezuela is just this one-dimensional oil economy. You know, they don't do anything. They don't produce anything. They got nothing happening. They're just, they're just uh, sitting on their oil money. The question you have to ask then is, well, why? Why is their economy set up that way, and who set it up that way? What people often forget is that the Venezuelan people have only controlled their oil for roughly 13 years. It's not a very long time. Certainly not long enough to be able to build up an infrastructure that can resist global capitalist forces. Very difficult to operate in a climate of economic and political hostility. And that really is how Venezuela's been operating. And despite all of that, Venezuela is the vanguard of anti-imperialism in Latin America. Without Venezuela and without Hugo Chavez, there most likely would be no Evo Morales, there would be no Rafael Correa, there would be no Daniel Ortega, there would be no left in Latin America, period. And so when we talk about Venezuela and we talk about the importance of Venezuela, we also have to talk about what Venezuela means for the rest of Latin America and what Venezuela means for those of us around the world who call ourselves anti-imperialists, who say that we are in a struggle against global imperialism. Venezuela means far more than just one country. Venezuela represents an idea. And that's what the Bolivarian Revolution really is. Okay? It is an idea. It is a process. And that's something that is difficult for a lot of people to grasp. And that was even something that, as Isolina was telling us, 
is even difficult for a lot of people in Venezuela, including a lot of Chavistas, to keep in mind that this is a process and that they've only been independent, quote unquote, for less than two decades, which is a very short time in the grand scheme of things. So this is leadership. That's what Venezuela has been providing in Latin America. That's why, I, I don't want to speak for Caleb, but I would assume Caleb would agree. That's why, for me, Venezuela was such an important issue. That's why it was so central to my own political development these last 17 years. That's why Venezuela matters. Now, there's another force in Latin America that we have to keep in mind, and that is the right wing. Because the right wing is not indigenous to any given country in Latin America. The right wing is an arm of US imperialism all over Latin America. The right wing is a proxy of the United States. It is directly controlled by the United States in various forms, be it through funding, through the US Chamber of Commerce, or the National Endowment for Democracy, or USAID, or the US embassies themselves. Okay? All of these different institutions act as conduits for US power manifested in Latin America by the right wing. And that is obviously rearing its ugly head in Venezuela for all of the reasons Caleb and Isolina were talking about. It's now rearing its head in Brazil as they try to destroy the let's call it social democratic left-wing government of Dilma Rousseff, whatever people, you know, criticisms or whatever aside, we know what the right wing in Brazil has done historically, and we know what the left wing in Brazil has done historically, at least these last 15 years or so. In Argentina, we just saw the resurgence of the right wing taking power, looking to undo all of the gains for working class people and poor people in that country under uh, the Kirchner and uh, Cristina Fernandez governments. We see all of these things, and those of us who see them through the lens of imperialism understand how these things are connected, and how what's happening in Venezuela is a reflection of an attempt uh, at resurgence by US imperialism throughout Latin America. They watched their position slip these last 15 years, and now they're striking back, and they're striking back hard. And understand that it is not simply about power for the sake of power. They want to prevent the Chinese from having relations with Venezuela. They want to prevent the Chinese from building in Nicaragua. They want to prevent any countries developing any kind of independent relations in Latin America unless it's under the auspices of organizations controlled by the United States. So Venezuela turns around and establishes its own independent institutions, ALBA, Petrocarib, uh, CELAC, many others that have been founded by Venezuela, by Hugo Chavez, that have had the leadership in Latin America. All of that the United States wants to undo. And what we witnessed in Venezuela is one way that they're doing that. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, how it's happening in Venezuela, how imperialism is striking back. Number one, and honestly, I, I, unfortunately, this is, just, this is just an inescapable fact. They've been very, very successful at waging an economic war against Venezuela, very successful. Anybody who is, you know, calls themselves a Chavista and tells you that things are not so, so bad, they're lying. They, things are tough for people right now. Things are difficult. Imperialism, the United States, the imperial system is very good at undermining, destabilizing, and overthrowing governments. They've done it for as long as any of us can remember, and they'll continue to do it. And they're doing it right now in Venezuela. This happens in the form of speculation, speculation against the currency, taking the currency out of the country, contraband out of the country, illegal exportation of commodities, illegal uh, exportation of goods. It happens in the form of manipulated and manufactured scarcity, as Isolina was talking about. It happens in the deprivation of staple goods. She was mentioning, she was mentioning it in, uh, Isolina was mentioning it in her uh, in her address there, and I couldn't help but laugh because um, on my way to Venezuela, I went through LaGuardia, 
and they took my sunscreen. They wouldn't let me take my sunscreen through the airport. They said the bottle was too big. So I said, all right, shit, that's a pain in the ass because I get burned easily. So I said, all right, what are you going to do? So they took my sunscreen. I never did find sunscreen in Venezuela. I was there almost two weeks. I never did find it. Never found deodorant, which for some reason I didn't have with me. Don't know why. Never did find it. Now, for me, it was a minor inconvenience. I was there for a relatively short period of time. But what if I lived there? What if that was my everyday life? Mm -hmm. Constantly looking for basic goods for my life, for my daily life. That would get hard. That would get frustrating. You would psychologically begin to identify your personal problems with those in power. Mm -hmm. And you would say, well, shit, I can't get sunscreen or deodorant. Somebody's got to pay for this. Well, who's going to pay for it? It's the government. I'm going to make them pay by voting against them. Yeah, yeah, I know these right-wingers are no good. I know. But you know what? This is the only way I can say that I'm pissed off. We heard that all the time. I, I mean, I felt like, you know, 10 days, I, I couldn't find this stuff. I was like, I get it. I understand why people are pissed. This is the kind of psychological war that imperialism wages. If you want, a, if you want, an, interesting, if you want an interesting insight into how they operate... Go look at the CIA's dossier, uh, CIA booklet on destabilizing Nicaragua against the Sandinistas. Part of the strategy of the CIA was to make the people of Nicaragua identify their personal problems with their government and to say, all of my problems are because of these Sandinistas. And if I could just get rid of the Sandinistas, my problems would be solved, or at least things would get a little bit better. Maybe the U.S. will ease up on us. I don't know. This is right in the CIA playbook. We all know it. It's public information. Anybody can go look it up on Google. Anybody who wants a document, I happily email it to you. This is how they operate, and this is what they're doing in Venezuela. So when we rode the, um, what would you call it, the, the, the Skyway, you know, the, 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 the cable, car? cable car, thank you, the cable car up we talked to a young woman, her finger's still purple, so she had just voted the, the, the day before, and we asked her about this working class neighborhood that she lived in and how it all went down the day before. And she was upset, she was sad. You were in the car with me, yeah. She was upset, she said, these people don't know what they've done. They don't even realize what they've done. I don't know if they're ignorant, ungrateful, Maybe both, but what they've done is a disaster. That was what she told us. Not, a very, not an uncommon position for people to have in Venezuela. She was probably, she had her own grievances against the government. She wasn't happy about everything, obviously. But she understood the importance of maintaining the course of the Bolivarian Revolution, and she was devastated that in her neighborhood, which had benefited so directly from the revolution, which had been connected with the rest of the city by these cable cars, made functional by the Socialist Party and by the Bolivarian government, and they still voted against them. This is how psychological war works, and the U.S. is doing it very, very well in Venezuela. Now, we have to say a couple of other things, though, because the U.S. is not simply waging an economic war here or a psychological war. There is a very real physical war going on in Venezuela. It might not be a traditional war the way that we think about it, but it is happening. Call it low-intensity warfare, if you would like. But you have thousands upon thousands of criminals on the streets in Venezuela, controlled directly by Colombian mercenaries, paramilitary organizations, and various other interests who can be directly traced to the United States. The United States gives billions of dollars to Colombia under the so-called Plan Colombia. Okay? Those, those billions of U.S. dollars that the U.S. gives, they're not just to fight the war on drugs. They are to fund paramilitary organizations and mercenaries and others that the U.S. and its proxy in Colombia can use to destabilize Venezuela, and that's what's happening. 
And that's what's been happening, okay? And um, a young man who was seen by many to be potentially an inheritor of Chavez's legacy, a man by the name of Robert Serra, who was assassinated by people directly connected to the former president of Colombia, okay? His body defiled, uh, obviously a political career snuffed out, potential leadership devastated. Just the other day, as Caleb was mentioning, Ricardo Duran, very important journalist and spokesperson for the uh, Bolivarian movement, assassinated. There is a very real war going on in Venezuela right now that we need to be aware of. Because if we're not, then we're missing a fundamental aspect of imperialism in Venezuela. It is economic, it is psychological, it is political in the form of this guy that is supposedly hope and change sitting in the White House who turns around and puts sanctions against Venezuela and calls Venezuela a threat to national security. Supposedly making deals with Cuba, yeah. supposedly opening relations with Cuba, and then turning around and shitting all over Venezuela. This is, this is the nature of the imperial war against Venezuela. And part of what we also need to recall is that one of the ways that the country or the government is fighting back against this is by trying to reconnect itself to the grassroots in the country. Because they're beginning to understand, I think, this is my opinion here, I think the government is beginning to understand that only by maintaining that direct connection between the grassroots movements in Venezuela and the government itself will it be able to fight this off. Because the government on its own will not survive this. Ultimately, 85% of its revenue is gone because of global oil prices. Eight, imagine, 85% of the revenue of the country gone in the span of, what's it been, about 18, 20 months since oil hit its high? How do you survive that? How does a country survive that? Yes, we know it's not great that Venezuela is so oil dependent. That's obviously something that has to be addressed long term. But in the short term, we have to understand that there is an existential crisis for Venezuela. Now, I know I'm, I'm, I'm just about to wrap up here, but I want to point out something also. The missions in Venezuela. So many people I've heard, even supposedly on the left, talk about how, well, you know, the Venezuelan government, they're not, it's not about socialism. They're just buying votes by giving people this stuff, free stuff, so that they can buy their votes and keep themselves in power. And my response to that would be, you mean like giving a million families places to live? You mean like giving people this luxury like a paved road or like electricity running in their houses? There is a psychological war also going on on the left internationally. And when we, when we address imperialism's assault on Venezuela, we also have to address those people around the world who want to denigrate what's happened in Venezuela. It's really important for us to remember that our true comrades are not people who identify as leftists. It's people who identify with the people of Venezuela and who will defend them. There are a lot of people who will not stand up and defend the Bolivarian Revolution. And those are not allies of ours. And I could point to just about every single person who calls themselves a Democrat. We could point to just about every single person who takes the paycheck from the NGOs. We can point to a lot of people, including a lot of people we know, and we have to be mindful of that. Now, I want to just close on one point. Caleb mentioned a trip that we made to uh, Comuna Panal, Beehive Commune. And there was a woman who spoke to us, really amazing, very impressive young woman. Her name was Anna Koana. 
Now, she said something that I used in one of my uh, pieces that I published while we were there, and I'll quote her verbatim. This is exactly what she said, word for word. She said, no volverán, which is we'll not go back, we're not going backwards. No volverán is not just a slogan for a t-shirt. It's a principle. It is our principle. That's what she said, and that's what she meant. And if not going backwards is the principle of Chavistas and the, and the Chavista movement, then surely it's our principle as well. And it's our duty to defend the revolution and to defend our brothers and sisters in Venezuela. Thanks. Okay.